Yep. We're recording now. Okay. We'll, let's, we'll just keep rolling. Just, just to take a quick, not, not even a detour, but can you tell uh, people where you're working right now and yeah. what you're doing? And Sure. So I'm, I am a, a clinical psychologist by training. I work at what's the, called the Lee County VA in um, Cape Coral, Florida. So I work with um, veterans with kind of general mental health concerns, as well as I, I do substance specific treatment. Let's take a trip back in time. Why don't we? Are you are you up for it? Sure, absolutely. I want to hear your. There to me, there was a very critical point in your life where you decided to go into the field of psychology, um, and that was a divergence from the path that you were on. Which I, from my perspective, I think it was like journalism, right? I mean, at least that's what you thought, and mm -hmm. that's what I thought. That's what our friends thought that Nick was yeah. going to do. And you took it, you decided to to go a different route. So um, I just want to hear about that time more and what that was like for you. Yeah, right. So we've known each other now 20, how many years have we known each other? 28 no. years, 29 years? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. About that. Uh, so you've known me a long time. We were freshman roommates, of course. Uh, yeah, I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to write stories and be in the know and get to meet people. I think this circles back to talking about the ego because I think I do think a lot of that was framed in wanting to be perceived a certain way. I do enjoy people. I wouldn't have gone into clinical psychology if I didn't enjoy people and people's stories. But there is something about wanting to be a writer that was definitely influenced by my desire to be seen a certain way, uh, to be seen as an intellectual, et cetera. And so- I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I, well, mm -hmm. I didn't, yeah, I didn't really, I, I haven't put those pieces together. It's something I had to like, just kind of own. And I had my own come to Jesus moment of like, you shouldn't be doing this based on a desire to be seen a certain way because you're going to go down this road and not enjoy it. And maybe you're, you know, yeah, you're going to get stuck in a, in a career that is because of other people. Yeah, that was, and honestly, I, you know, I re actually wanted to hear, I'll, I'll complete the story. So um, I went to school for journalism. I have a journalism degree actually. And then through my kind of undergraduate journey, I had this realization that you shouldn't be doing this because of other people and the way they might see you. You should try to do something that one, you're good at and, and two is for you. And I enjoy people and I enjoy people's stories. And I, I guess having my own father as a psychologist was an influence of this is a career that is possible. You know, I, I've talked to my wife who grew up in the South, and I don't think that that's not the sort of career that felt possible, um, perhaps for her, just based on, you know, who she had in her life. So it was, it was kind of a natural fit. Like, I'm interested in people. I'm interested in the mind. I'm interested in helping people and being a part of their journey. So that's kind of how we segued into working in the, the helping professions. So I, I came to California and that's, we, I guess we both came to California together. We definitely um, overlapped, uh, we overlapped for a minute to California. Can I ask about, I want to, I'm still curious about the journalism thing because you mentioned, you said that part of it or a big piece of it was like wanting to be seen as an intellectual, but like mm -hmm. there are many different fields that you could have got, that you could have tried to pursue that, that would have where you would have been perceived as an intellectual. So like, was there something else about journalism that drew you to it? I think I, I think I've, I've always enjoyed stories and telling people stories as a way to get at some more deeper things that might be going on. I always, like, I enjoy long articles that are framed that way that there's a personal story 
that the journalist is trying to tell that is representative of something bigger that is going on, some idea, some cultural uh, moment, et cetera, that's being told in, an, in a personalized story. So that that's what really made me interested in journalism is the overlap of the story, you know, the personalized story that can stand in for bigger ideas that, you know, my mind is also drawn to as that well. That makes sense. I mean, in both cases too, like, I mean, journalism, psychology, it's like, you want to like, kind of like understand how it is. Uh-huh. How does <laughs> like, this work? Yeah. Can how do, we, how do things figure work? this out? And then you want to tell people about it mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. help people understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there's definitely, there is an ego investment about having your name on a byline and uh that doesn't go away um at least if you're if you're pursuing academia <laughs> uh, if you're in academia right yeah. having those uh first author yeah and then, so kind of circling back I, I i wanted to be an academic right too i don't know if you remember this like i i, I thought i wanted to be a professor and mm-hmm. to do research think my thoughts ask my questions, get my name published. And that was also ego. There's also, that was also this idea of like, I want to, I want, I'm doing this to be seen in a specific way. As if it's, the mind is so bizarre because it, it, in the background, it's like, if I'm seen a certain way, then I'll be okay. (laughs) I'll be fine as long as I have the esteem of all these, all these people think I'm smart and I've got it together and yada, yada. Yeah. And you get pulled into that and, and it pulls you along. And I, I've been lucky enough to come to my senses at, at certain points to say, hold on this, who is this for? This isn't for you. This is for, you know, this, subject inside you who wants all these things wants the world to you know bow down (laughs) do you hopefully yeah hopefully you can uh identify with some of that no i mean well 100 percent. i mean obviously i like i also had a time where i wanted to go into academia um but it's not for me like i even recognize like the shift out of that and wanting to be kind of more independent in the world, mm-hmm. that's not uh, that's not rid of ego at all. I mean, no. me, like there's a lot of ego there for sure. Even being in, you know, being a clinical clinical psychologist, being involved in people's lives. That's what I wanted to ask you. Is that like so now? So you made that you decided to shift onto this different path, but do you notice that same thing coming up of like wanting like if, for for reasons of wanting to have a certain esteem or like have that security of like I don't know you know you're we're you know you have a PhD um, mm-hmm. so and that's always attached to your name your doctor your doctor Nick Fedor yeah it's not as much I'm struggling to answer because it's still there of course I think it's it's more in the it's more when I'm thinking when I'm not doing the work itself, when I'm not with people, I'm sure there are times when it sneaks in with individual cases, um, but it's more like when I'm thinking about my work and the esteem that I get for my patients and how nice that feels like a- after the fact, rather than like when I'm with them, I'm I'm trying to just be with them and hoping doing my best that that doesn't sneak in Mm -hmm. Uh, there. I mean, there are certainly times when I think it probably does um, maybe luxuriating in their esteem more than I should. Hopefully being mindful of that and trying to understand what is going on between me and this other person. It's, it's really beautiful though, because I mean, you've chosen a, you've chosen a job where you're actually required to for certain moments of the day not bathe in that the thinking process mm-hmm. 
and mm-hmm. you really have to be present with someone else. So of course, that's still going to be there to some extent, like for all of us, no matter what career we have, but you have to insert yourself into these moments every single day where you're just fully present with people. And that's a cool exercise. That's a nice exercise for the mind. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I get to be mindful all day long and noticing when I'm thinking about lunch rather than thinking about my patients. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I try to think of like just the strangest examples where the mind just goes to the dumbest places when I'm hearing really important things from people. The mind just wants to go away, but it then you come back over and over and over again. So yeah, I get to practice all day long. I mean, the types of thoughts, yeah, the the problems that I'm trying to solve in my head while I'm simultaneously listening to pay, like noticing drifting off and trying to like solve these problems it's like amazing yeah and then we we come back over and over and yeah. over i struggle we were talking about this yeah, a couple of weeks ago um in a managed because the v is not managed care um but in a space where you're trying to get people along quickly um i it it causes me to be honestly not as mindful as I could be because I'm wanting stuff to happen. And I feel like I need, I'm needing to make it happen. So I, I, I find myself talking more than I'd like to. So I feel like I got to impart my, you know, wisdom and they're going to understand these skills and we're going to use them instead of just, can I listen Sorry, you were you were gonna ask a question. Yeah, I, I see if I can if I can still string this together because I feel like it's sort of a deep question. So we'll see if we can get there. Maybe you help me a little bit. But um, well, I was I was gonna comment on how you know like the basically trying to like create this quick short term change in people. While it can sometimes be effective in the short term, oftentimes it's not as effective at creating long-term sustainable change. It creates a revolving door effect where people might get a little bit better, but then they come back into the VA or back into the clinic or whatever. So yes, so it, you're not in your head. You like, I think we agree on that, like in the context of like therapy, but I'm wondering now, like intrapersonally, like what your thoughts are on that, like with ourself, like trying to trying to create change within ourselves, like the difference between like using these like strategies and tools. And oftentimes I think those are based in self judgment and shame. I need to change myself. I'm not good the way that I am now. Think about like a diet, for example, right? Like that's often or whatever I'm trying to exercise more. That's often coming from a place of self inadequacy. And so we use these strategies and it like works for a little bit, but then it's not sustainable versus the approach that you're referring to is when you're just sitting with people and you're being present and you're letting things unfold and it's coming more from a place of presence and patience and love and trust as well, trust in the process. And I'm curious what your thoughts like intrapersonally, like is like how that experience is for you and trying to like create change and yeah. Well, the, the struggle is I forget that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I forget that there's a famous um, quote from Carl Rogers where he's essentially just said exactly what you just said is that only once I accept myself then can I change? And I can change, yeah. Right. And the problem I find is like, I forget that that's actually, the, that's it. And and I'm so focused on change that, and it's it sucks, man. I'm Because you're sending the message to the patient, right? We got to change. Quote, unquote, you're not okay as you are. Which is, yeah, yeah. Keep going, keep going. And it, it, it's just sad, that, and it makes me think about how I actually I do forget that that um, there's a attitude of which I'm approaching my patients when I only have twelve sessions with them that you are not okay as you are. There are some things that we need to do um, to fix you. That's that's maybe too harsh a way of putting it. Um, 
but there's well i know you're not saying that verbally but i but sometimes i think that's the message that people's brains are receiving on a more subconscious level mm -hmm. i think so too and um and then they resist it of course mm -hmm. we should probably spend the time to be interested in why you know quick change efforts don't have the, the long-term impact but you know no one's got time for that because there's more people to be seen um there there's got to be a you know there's a way that even in short-term care um where you can have the posture you are perfect as you are and there are some things we can do differently it's I'd like to think that that's possible. You, we might need to ca re like recalibrate what's what is possible in terms of change efforts there. Um, that, that at least that's the ideal that I'd like to, the way in which I like to be practicing. No, I I, I do think it's possible, and I'm I believe that you embody that as a therapist. Just knowing you as a person, I believe that you embody that as a therapist, in how you relate to people how you listen, the way that you talk to them. I think you can send both of those messages at the same time, um, even in a short-term context. Yeah. I appreciate that. I try. Uh, I don't feel like I've been doing such a good job. Maybe I'm just down on myself right now, having lots of thoughts about my work. Uh, yeah. But, I, but I, I do try. And I, one of my, I think my biggest, my greatest skills, and this is because of my practice, I think is be so I'm I am proud of it in that way. It's just being able to sit with in intensity. Um I feel very capable of just being with people in intense situations where either they're pissed at me, they're you know, they're experiencing immense amounts of pain. And I, I owe that a lot to my to to meditation. Mm -hmm. And being able to differentiate what's my distress, what's their distress. Can I sit with my own distress while, you know, focusing on their distress and trying to be with them? Um, hmm. You know, I, I was thinking about reflecting back on when you started meditating in college and trying to remember what I thought you were doing. Because so, so the truth is, right, I didn't start meditating. Well, you we were we were 18 years old. So I I didn't start meditating until I was 29, 28, something like that. Um so that's I guess you you got 10 years on me in that way. But from what I remember thinking, I thought you were just breathing. I think that's that's what I remember you doing, and and I wish I was more interested, honestly, in what you were doing, at the time instead of just thinking, oh, he's deep breathing. I I know how to do that. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking about like being in our dorm room and like you're probably like trying to go to sleep, and I'm like probably sitting up and cross like and breathing really loudly with a Ram Dass book next to me. <laughs> like, what the fuck is he doing? <laughs> I thought, I, I thought you crazy. were, yeah, I was, I just thought you were breathing. And it's like, oh, that that's probably nice uh, that he's, he's doing some deep breathing. <laughs> but I was never actually interested in, in what you were, what you were up to. And my way into meditation was not even through my own suffering, which I know is like, that's a, uh, often a way that people find their way to meditation is like, you know, there's something about my experience that isn't quite right. And I've heard that this, this game over here, uh, can help. Mine was really, you know, all these treatments that use mindfulness, uh, as a part of, you know, acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, all these third wave psychotherapy treatments that use mindfulness, I felt like I should probably learn what it is, what the hell they're talking about, instead of just telling my patients to go and meditate, um, or even just using some of the ideas 
like DBT makes it very easy to just kind of use the ideas of mindfulness in the treatment. I felt like I should probably learn what what this is. And that's what really opened me up to this whole landscape of my own subjectivity that I had really never been interested in before. I never, never found interest in just paying attention to what is going on probably as a way of avoidance. I've never really enjoyed paying attention to my own subjectivity, my own thoughts and feelings. Um, but finding a method to do that systematically was really useful. And it it is, it's been probably the most important thing I've ever learned um, how to do. I don't know if you would agree with that for yourself. Um, but when I, when I try to tell patients about mindfulness, I really frame it that way. Like, if you if you get this this is the, like the and you practice it it can be one of the most important things you ever learn how to do interesting i want to come back to that in a second um um introducing the practice to patients cuz it sounds cool. like actually we do that very differently but i'm curious um you mentioned when you first started practicing it was helping you to see your thoughts and emotions and relate to them differently. You found that really useful. Mm -hmm. um, like, what did you find useful about that? Like, why was that helpful for you to start being more aware of what your thoughts and feelings were? I think it's, it's just waking up from being on autopilot was useful and not even realizing that I was on autopilot so much of the time. Um, that will that's what was useful where you you have some flexibility in how at least a bit more flexibility like I, i'm not i have not perfected this thing um but you have more flexibility in how you act where it goes okay this i'm aware of my thinking i'm aware of my feelings versus i'm just being hijacked by my reactivity which is where i was before i think i'm lucky in being sort of emotionally stable um, I don't more on the depressive end of things, but in terms of just having highs and lows, I'm pretty stable. So I, I, I never really felt like I needed to look into my own subjectivity because things felt like they were at least working out. Okay. Uh, as, as well as I could like, imagine this, this is just how I was going through life. Um, but then realizing that there's actually more. I, I can have a bit more flexibility in how I show up to the world than simply being on autopilot. That was the, that's what was originally or initially beneficial, just being able to step back, um, not even realizing before that I could step back, that, that there's another way to relate to my internal experience, to just watch it. And why, why do you think that was useful to be able to do that or why was that important to be able to do that um because it it helps me this is going to sound <laughs> it helps me be who i'd like to be <laughs> i was going to say it helps me be a better person it, it it really does help me be my best self when i'm able to do it and i'm able to really be non-judgmental of my experience and not reactive i'm able to then show up in the next moment as my best self right as i'd like to be instead of what my mind is telling me i should be doing um or just being re totally reactive to my experience so i, I think that that's really it's it's less about presence and savoring the moment which is all a, a benefit of the practice of course but it's more about what it frees me up to go do, which is to go, you know, actually choose how I'd like to act and be around people versus just kind of being at the whim of my my next thought um, or next internal experience. And it, it, you tell me if this is too in, interrogative, uh, mm -hmm. this, this process, but I, I'm finding it interesting um what what are the what are the ways that you're able to show up because of your practice in life and with other people like how does it allow you to show up what is that thing that 
allows it to come forward. The word that comes to mind is honestly tender. I'm able to be more te more tender and more vulnerable with people than I would be otherwise. You get to, right, your, your mind is saying, here's an example of like, okay, my mind is saying, I want to tell this person how much I love them. Right? Or my, maybe it's like my heart is saying that. Um, there's something deep inside me. And my mind is saying, they don't want to hear that or they're not going to reciprocate or mm. this is not the right time for that, right? All the chatter about that. And being able to observe it, I can show up and try to be lean in, be more willing to just share my heart with another person interesting that's the most extreme example um of like okay i want to show up as loving and caring with people and be, for whatever reason my psychology does not make that natural and like how do i <clears throat> how do i do that still while knowing that my mind and my anxiety that comes along with that is going to tell me otherwise no you shouldn't do that you shouldn't be tender with people um it sounds like a big piece of the the practice for you has been like leaning into discomfort and it's like and the discomfort is the the where that's coming from is like the discrepancy between like how you act on autopilot and like what you feel is like your your inner compass of like how you want to be and that's uncomfortable to follow that inner compass and the mindfulness practice has allowed you to pause to be aware and to lean more into that and therefore to feel like you're living more authentically yeah i think that's that's well put um i don't do this perfectly i wish it was much more seamless honestly this goes back to what we were talking before it's like i no, i actually just wish that the discomfort would go away so that i could be my authentic self all the <laughs> yeah. time and just be hugging and kissing all the babies i see <laughs> um, yeah but no it, it has uh, that and you know just other experiences has taught me you know how much <clears throat> how much i was on autopilot and how much more there there is that I want to experience and, and want to show to the world. I feel obviously we've, we've talked about your practice and your experience with mindfulness, like, you know, over and over again, but like, I feel like I'm learning something new about it because like, for I think you are sort of an outlier in like the reasons why you came to practice and the reasons why you continue to practice, at least from my understanding. Um, in that it really is about like living this more authentic life and like who you are and who you want to be. And I think most people do come in through the door of suffering and trying to figure out how do I help to ease the suffering in some way. And that that's for sure the case for me. And it's just, it's really interesting to see like how we came to the practice for different reasons and how we continue maybe to practice like yeah. for slightly with slightly different motivations behind it. And I don't know, your, your experience in the practice just feels really just like fresh and like, I don't know, it just, it feels like it just, it feels, it just feels really, really, really good. Like, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm just it just it just feels yeah. nice it's i'm curious you know what your posture is when you sit down in the morning like what you're hoping to get but i i actually do think that in meditating i actually learned how much i was suffering without really knowing it which kind of comes back to what you were saying before about are we teaching people these tools which is then enabling them to suffer more um yeah but i, I guess I, what i'm describing about why i practice is really that's the aspiration i you know that's the aspiration i hope for my clients too is like you don't do this to become a meditator you don't do this to become enlightened um hopefully not uh, if there is such a thing uh, you do this so that you can be your best self whatever that means to you. Mm -hmm. 
would you say, Nick, that like not being your best self creates suffering? Because like I'm I'm trying to understand like whether this all funnels back to suffering for people, which would sort of help me understand this in like a very coherent, unified way. Yeah, I think so. I think that's that's probably right. Um, that it, yeah, there's something about when I'm not living my best self, or when I know, you know, I was not there for that conversation with so and so. Like I was out to lunch. I'm never going to get that conversation back. You know, mind starts to ruminate on all the things I could have been said, all the ways um, I quote unquote should have shown up. So yeah, I, I do think so. Um, wanting to live life with free as free of regrets as I can be is the motivation. Um, the way I think about it actually is like, there can be a, a way of running from something like you you sit down to practice to get away from yourself and are you wanting to meditate your way out of your internal experience um and then there could be meditating to like move towards something or run towards something uh, i'm not actually sure if either are healthy or unhealthy um because it's you're saying that this as it is is not where it's at uh, uh, exactly. but I, I think i'm probably in the more like i'm running towards something like it, you know if i do this um it'll free me up but, but the thing is, is that it's shown me that i can do that like practicing has, has has freed me up in certain ways where i've seen the benefits um, in, in my relationships specifically. Is it a spiritual practice for you? I'm going to say no. Um, I haven't thought about it, honestly. I think loving people is a spiritual practice for me that I've recently feel like I've been put quite distant from uh, just with all the things that were going on in my life, uh, all the ways in which all that love is being kind of funneled into one person and having some regrets about not being so present with all the other important people in my life. Um, so I, I, that's my long way of saying that's more of the spiritual practice of like, being loved and loving and yeah it's interesting it makes it sound like mindfulness is the tool to help me do that um maybe it is i don't know i, I find it yeah i guess would would you say it's a spiritual practice for you and and if so can you say what that means i would say very much so and, and then i was just thinking about okay well how are we defining spiritual practice but um, I, I would say th that 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 is the that is the the primary motivation for me. I mean, there there's motivations right around like mental health and well being, um, but really, I practice it's for for spiritual reasons, like within the framework of like evolving, um, and um, honestly, just um, uh, not coming back in the next lifetime. That, that that's that's my framework. Is like I'm trying to take care of the work, um, right. and I know I know it sounds kind of weird to to say, but uh, truthfully, like that's that's where that's the place where that I come to the practice from. Um, yeah, in service of 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 that. Um, I think that's that's behind it all. Is. So you call you're calling that spiritual. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, gosh. Hmm. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I think I think of spirituality in two ways. I think of it as like, you know, from the perspective of like something a little bit more metaphysical. Um from the perspective of like reincarnation and, and uh, what, you know, the work that we do in this life and whether that's in service of, you know, 
not just ourselves, but of, of the world. Um, but I also have like a more grounded kind of daily, you know, sense of spirituality too. It's just about just living with gratitude and, and having deep relationships. And like you said, like, you know, loving people, um, that's it as well. Um, yeah, I'm curious what you think of this definition that was um, helpful for me in terms of understanding spirituality is like a, a search for um, the sacred or something, whatever sacred is, a, I guess maybe more religious term, but something larger. Um, and that that feels right to me. It's like I'm doing things to be a part of something larger, whether it's relationships or this human project. I think that, I think that resonates, um, on some level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, we do it for ourselves for, I think for our own evolution, but also that is in service of the world somehow. I mean, I think, I think that we're, we each have our own shit to work out in this lifetime, our own karma to deal with. And we do that um, and that gives back, that contributes back into the collective pot somehow. But we each have to take responsibility for our own shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is making me, again, realize just how much I, I feel like I have been distant from relationships recently. I mean, I think, well you know, all of your attention, I think, is going to one being, and she probably needs your attention more than anyone else right now um, in your life. And you guys are, you guys are super busy. And, and, and but the, I mean, you have, there are two, there are two relationships that <laughs> like mm -hmm. need to be taken care of with the time and energy that you have. And that's, you know, your wife and, and your daughter. But part of it also is just like, is I think just getting older. Um, and the difficulties of making meaningful relationships, the, the older we get, this is like, oh, this is true as much for women, but definitely for men, it is, it is tough to sustain meaningful relationships that extend beyond the folks you grew up with. Um, I've had this term in, of mine that I always considered myself a, a friend snob because I had really high standards for people that I was going to let into my life. <laughs> um, yeah, I still I have know. high standards because it's like you you grow up with people and they know you inside and out and you, they get you, right? you, you being case number one in terms of my life. And then you meet other people and you really have to fucking invest the time and energy and attention to get anywhere close to those other relationships. At least that's the framing. It's, it's probably not quite right. Um, it's the way my mind frames it is like, I gotta, I gotta invest all this time. Um, I know there's, there's like a, data point where it's like you need 150 hours of shared time with another person for them to be considered a close friend and that's a lot of time that is a ton of time uh, and so there's a way in which you know as i've gotten older i just haven't put out as much energy to collecting relationships um, as much as i should honestly mm -hmm. i don't like that word should but I, I i do feel like this is a it's a should for me because there's a regret there. Uh, and I guess talking to you now is making me realize how much, um, how much I miss you and how much I miss just um, friends, having friends. It's been the three of us for a little while now out here in, in the Florida wilderness. Yeah, well, I mean, having you as a friend makes turns me into a friend snob for sure. And uh, the friends that we grew up with, um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I've experienced the same thing. And uh, 
Yeah, honestly, Nick, I mean, yeah, like if, if you compare the relationships, if you compare the relationships that you're forming, you know, like in comparison to like, you know, our relationship or relationships with other friends, like it, it's, it's so hard to compete with that. Yeah, and that's the problem. They can't be compared. You, you can't compare. Right. And that's, that's the issue. Right. And that, I, I've definitely done that. Someone's got to like write a book about how men, how, how as men do we make friends later in life? Yeah. Is there a book out there? And if there is, I would love to read it. Yeah. Someone's got to give us some advice here. Uh, <laughs> it's fucking hard, man. I mean, I'm sure it's, I can't even imagine how it is in Fort Myers, but even in LA, I mean, obviously it's a huge city and everything, but it's just hard, man. Like to make friends that stick mm -hmm. um, and to be consistent. Everyone's got their own life. Everyone's got their own shit and yep. their wives and the, their lives and everything. And it's like, yeah, you like make friends, but like, I don't know, like deep friendships. I mean, that is, that is rare to create a new 150 deep hours. Yeah. It's a lot of time. I don't think I've spent 150 hours with anybody that I haven't lived with. <laughs> um, Outside of maybe our group of friends. Right. Because we knew each other I've so long. Since yeah. Childhood. yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult. And again, that comes back to lowering the bar of expectations. How are you on time, Nick? I know you have, speaking I'm of good. kids. She's, a, and, okay. she's asleep, I think. Um, just have a, a wife. So tell me about being a dad. Uh, Lena is, I want to say, ten months now. Is she, that right? She turned. She she was ten months on Friday. So she'll have her first birthday coming up um, in April. It's wild. <laughs> it's it's wild. Um, you know, our our other friend, mutual friend, when he told me about being a parent, he had the, the his most wise thing to say was basically, you don't just become another person when you become a parent, you're just yourself with a child. And <laughs> so if you, if you knew me before, just think of yourself, right, in this moment, and then you have a child. And that's kind of what it is. I guess you have, you have nine months to prepare yourself, but nothing really changes drastically between before and after so like every moment is just like this is wild that i'm taking care of this living being it's it's special uh you know we you and i have talked about the ways in which the cons of parenthood are easily known to you know all those who do not have kids and like i could talk about all the ways that it infringes on my happiness and honest and Allie and I's, you know, relationship satisfaction, but most especially, uh, I know there's a, there's like a, basically a U shaped curve for relationship satisfaction. <laughs> so when, when a couple has a child, it's like basically swoop, <laughs> swoops back up when the, when the child leaves. Um, but the the pros are just getting to love uh, another being unconditionally and growing with them in ways that are different. Like it's different than growing with a friendship or even a partner. Mm. It's like you're growing with them and your love is growing and I I don't know how to put it into words the the bonds that are created. Like I said, I I can enumerate the cons of becoming a parent. Uh, easy, easy enough. But I it's hard to convey what you gain. Mm -hmm. um, and she's a she's special. She's like not a baby. She's a strange little thing she she has never liked cuddle she has never been um like a baby she's always been more curious about the world and 
So like when I'm holding her, like I, I hold her this way, she'll push me and try to spin she herself wants to around. Look out. Interesting. Yeah. She's always done that. She she has done that since she was like a month old. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. It's she's 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 a baby in other ways, right? She um cries and poops, but in that way and wanting to be in the know of what's going on. Um yeah, she's got a cool little temperament too. She's pretty chill. She seems chill. <laughs> She's she is chill. She's I think she's getting that from her her mother and myself. How is it, Nick? Like how is like the the fear of like like you know, all this like one day you bring home like a human from the hospital and like of course you said, you know, you can read books, but you of course you, you sort of don't know what you're doing. You have to figure it out. Like, has that fear subsided as you've like gotten confidence? Like, oh, I I can figure this out. Or do you still continue to like have that like, um, like, okay, well, like we know how to take care of her now as like a toddler, but like, what about when she's like one and then two? Like, how do you raise that kid? Like, does that still linger for you, or it just kind of went away? Yes and no. Yeah, you you really do just figure it out. Uh, you don't have there's really there's no time to there's time to read books. I read a book about um sleep infant sleep which is was definitely needed because as much as they sleep like you they really don't know how to sleep you have to teach them how to sleep but other than that you're you're just figuring it out and seeing what works and trying to be consistent you know and I had because of my degree and my um background I have some ideas on like what is healthy and what is not healthy, what I want to be reinforcing, what I don't want to be reinforcing, you know, and every time she gets upset and calms down is like, that's a, that's a great time. That's, that's a win. That's Wait, exactly. Tell, tell me, tell me more about that. Like how, how you do that. You, 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 like, you like, do you, do you like praise her, like reinforce her when she calms it down and, and how do you deal mm-hmm. with it when she is worked up? Just being calm and supportive and helping her regulate you know using me or using you know her mother to calm down we use other people to is that through like like soothing mechanisms like you know touch and and yeah. more the body touch my voice yeah singing um <laughs> rocking right you, know, you ever seen a patient rock there's a reason that that folks do that it, it is soothing um but every time she does that, every time she gets worked up and then comes back down is a win. That's because of what we're teaching her to do mm. is to regulate herself. Um, that's so you, that's our job is to socialize her. You're there with her while she's experiencing dysregulation. You're mm-hmm. soothing her and she's hopefully internalizing those. And then she calms down and you say it's a win, like, I mean, which I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm following that. Um, do you, do you like, do, do you like give some sort of reinforcement or something like that? Or you're just saying like, just um, mentally like, yeah, this is a win. I, it, it depends. Um, usually I'll like, I'll, we'll try to name what's going on. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that, that was really scary. Uh, um, that hurt, didn't it? Or when you, that hurt when you, you Nick, banged you're head. such a good dad, man. She's going to be great. <laughs> She's going to be great. You really just figure it out. It, um, and I, you know, I'm lucky in my own upbringing to have good parents, and same with my wife. And but you just kind of, you're just kind of doing that. Yeah. Um, you're narrating her internal experience, um, at least trying to. The the funny thing is, and this gets back to your original question, is the this period right now is the easiest period. That we're gonna have. She she doesn't have language. She, <laughs> she can't she tell can't, you to fuck off yet. She can't walk. Right. She can't tell. She can't tell us fuck no. I'm not eating my broccoli. Um. So and you know this is only going to get harder and harder, and you know hopefully we'll just take it stage by stage. Mm-hmm. And the hardest time is like when they actually have human problems when they're teenagers, and they have actual problems. Yeah that I don't have a solution for. Mm-hmm. 
and your relation your relationship gets strained somehow mm-hmm. inevitably yeah i try not life. to worry about that it's like it, the stages will come mm-hmm. when they come and we'll do our best when they they get here so it sort of brings us brings us me back to like the beginning of our conversation a little bit about like being present and like being in the now not just like this literal moment but kind of like the stage of life that we're in and you were talking about like how you try your best to do that, like in each and every moment. And um, how do you do that? I'm just, I'm wondering like, is, are there, is it just, is it a shift that happens like because of your practice? Like are there certain like mental, are there like phrases that you like tell yourself or like mental um, things that you reference to kind of keep yourself in this moment and in this phase of life? Cause I think this is so hard for people. Yeah. I think I don't have a, I don't have mantras or phrases. There's no be here now. Sort of <laughs> uh, it's just, you're, yeah. It, it's really just recognizing when I'm lost in thought and coming back over and over and over. And honestly, even more practically, it's recognizing when I'm on my phone um, in her presence that that has been important in the ways in which that like when I'm on my phone, I'm clearly not present, even more so than when I'm, you know, watching a movie in my mind. Um, to try and I can be intentional about that of just like, okay, if I'm gonna be on the ground with my daughter, there's no reason for me to have my phone yeah. nearby. Um yeah, I don't know, man. It's really just recognizing when you're lost and trying to come back over and over it's not there's nothing special about you know having a child that changes anything I, it's more um there's a there's a tangible reason why beyond just this is a better way of being uh it's like oh, this is better for for her and for me to really be present mm-hmm. and undistracted. Um, and you you know that because you know that through experience. Like mm-hmm. you're saying, like it's not, I think like that distinction is helpful sometimes of like, this is what I should be doing versus like this is what I know serves me and the people around me best. And I know that in my in my flesh and bones. Yeah, it's 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 more enjoyable. Uh, and she notices it. If I'm not there playing with her, like she, she'll know. I mean, there are times when she's off in her own world and I totally could be on my phone, but then that's not as enjoyable for me in that moment. Um, this will certainly be truer when she has language and she could say, daddy, you're not doing whatever. <laughs> We're not playing with the castle. You're on, you're on your phone. What What's what's your favorite toy to to play with with her oh damn um she's got um she's got these blocks that i like um we bang together so we'll just be banging blocks um on the floor (laughs) bringing the blocks together i I like doing that with her and i'll play the drums on the ground we got tile floor so i'll play the the blocks as like drum sticks that's probably my favorite. Uh, she got a, she has a ball, actually a little ball that we'll throw, which is bizarre. The fact that, that she can throw the ball to me. Um, this is what I mean when I say she's not a baby. She should not be being engaging in play like that. Reciprocal, like yeah, yeah. That is not the stage of development she should be in right now. <laughs> the kind of parallel play, but she does. She l- literally throws me the ball. She like winds up. With- <laughs> amazing she's she must yeah. be strong she is she can she's she'll probably be walking my bet is next month, month sometime at the yeah. end of next month i saw her moving around the other day and i mean she she can move she she covers some ground <laughs> she's like she's quick yeah she's she's quick. Quick. we don't really restrict her movement in our house too much we let her roam um, and hopefully try to watch her as best we can what advice do you have for me and for the day that I become a parent? Hmm. Just 
just remember that it's okay to be good enough. As the psychoanalyst um, Winnicott had says, the good enough mother. You just you just need to be good enough. It's like there's no right or wrong, really. You just you're good enough. You if you show attention and love, they'll be okay. It's been our experience so far. Um, yeah, and you'll figure it out. Um, I remember we talked about when I found out we were pregnant and my honestly, incredibly uh, averse, aversive reaction to it. Yeah, that's that's what it made me think of is in your sort of journey, I remember through, I think something like that, something like a, around feeling like that you will be good enough, having to accept that, that you won't be perfect. And yeah. well, my thing was, I was just afraid of, and this is going to sound, no, it doesn't sound ridiculous. I was being, I was afraid I wasn't going to love her. Um, I wasn't going to love my child. And so she'd just like be here. I would be responsible for this little thing as almost almost as if I'd be responsible for somebody else's child like that hmm. I don't love and the difficulty of that. Um, but that didn't turn out to be true. And now I'm here, <laughs> I'm here hearing her. I don't know if that is a good sign. This has been fun. Nick, it's, it's been awesome. It's been good just to see you, connect with you, but also just to have these conversations like we do. Um, you can get in there. <laughs> we can do this again. Sure. Anytime, honestly, literally anytime. I'd love to. Thank you, ma'am. Love you, ma'am.